you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, I've been before and had a great time last time. The Protestant Reformation began, arguably, on October the 31st, 1517, with the publication of Martin Luther's famous 95 Theses, translated into, from Latin into German by the end of 1517 and then printed and distributed widely, the theses were almost immediately being read throughout Germany and within a few months they had reached the rest of Europe. For the next three decades, Luther continued to debate with his opponents to teach, to write tracts in pursuit of his vision of a reformed church. And by the time of his death, not only had Luther been excommunicated for refusing to recant his mistaken views, but Western Christendom had become divided, of course, between Protestant and Roman Catholic camps. At the heart of this well-known story lie questions of authority and intrinsically connected to these questions of biblical interpretation. Luther and those who followed his lead argued that Holy Scripture and not the Bishop of Rome should be the final authority in matters of faith and life. The argument that's often referred to using the slogan, uh, Sola Scriptura. There we are. Scripture could easily serve as such an authority in the reformer's view because it was perspicuous. It required no special erudition to grasp its basic content. Once a reader possessed a good translation on the basis of the original languages and a few rudimentary rules of reading. No one, Luther once said, could have undue difficulty in understanding the plain meaning of the sacred text since the Holy Spirit is the simplest writer and advisor in heaven and on earth, end quote. His emphasis on the plain sense is a strong one here and elsewhere in his writings, and it conforms to the broadly held Renaissance humanist opinion of his time. Such opinion rejected the common idea of the preceding medieval and patristic centuries that other levels of meaning in a text, sometimes summarized under the heading allegorical, were often or even normally more important than the literal sense that this allegorical reading represented the spiritual sense. There was widespread agreement among the magisterial reformers to the contrary. For them, the literal sense of scripture rooted in its historical context was in fact also its spiritual sense. As each text was read in the context of the whole unfolding covenantal story of the Bible. Almost 500 years have elapsed since the publication of the 95 Theses, and the Protestant church that Luther accidentally founded in the subsequent years has grown at an astonishing rate since that time. This might suggest to the casual observer, among other things, that Protestant biblical ter interpretation remains alive and well that Protestant hermeneutics continue to give an account of the Bible and of human experience that many people find compelling. The reality, however, is rather different. Probe just beneath the surface and not very far below, and you will find that in fact, the contemporary field of Protestant hermeneutics, both at a scholarly and at a popular level, lies in some disarray. The situation may satisfactorily be summarized by describing briefly four contemporary ways of reading. Among the various scholarly heirs of the Reformation, we find among our contemporaries, first of all, those of an historical critical mindset. Dominant in many Western universities throughout most of the late 19th and then the 20th centuries, historical critics have shown a consistent interest in the written and oral traditions that underlie our biblical texts. These first way critics, as I'm going to call them, have displayed a strong commitment to establishing single, original, and literal meanings for biblical texts in their various historical contexts and languages, and they have prioritized these meanings in their reflections on theology and practice, often over against prevailing norms of interpretation. <clears throat> 
First way scholarship has tended at the same time to diminish the importance of, or to ignore, interpretive questions that arise at the level of whole sections of the biblical text or of the biblical canon as a whole. The contemporary hermeneutical scene is marked secondly by more recent postmodern approaches to the Bible, emphasizing the independence of text from their authors and the role of the reader in constructing meaning out of texts. The text in itself as an historical artifact or even as an objective reality in the present becomes much less important in this way of thinking than those who encounter the text or even create the text as they read it. Here, questions of original textual meaning greatly diminish in importance. So do many theological and ethical perspectives that have long been regarded because they've been regarded as rooted in scripture as central to Protestant Christian faith. This kind of postmodern thinking has made impressive inroads into contemporary Protestant communities, shaping or influencing their hermeneutics. What is often called the emergent church in particular has been significantly impacted by this way of approaching the Bible. A third way, a third group of contemporary Protestant interpreters set their face resolutely against both modernist and postmodern biblical hermeneutics. This position finds its institutional home in conservative Christian churches, seminaries, and other institutions, especially in North America, and is well represented not so much by a person as by a document edited by this gentleman, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics. Third way, Bible readers, as I'm calling them, flatly reject postmodern developments in pursuit of the single definite and fixed meaning expressed in each biblical text. But they also urge caution with respect to modern biblical scholarship as well. This kind of commitment to Reformation principles leads third way Bible readers not only to reject modern and postmodern developments in biblical hermeneutics, but also in other spheres as well, including science. A similar negative assessment of modernity and postmodernity is evident, finally, among other Protestants who nevertheless propose a very different approach to biblical hermeneutics. These fourth way thinkers are sympathetic to some Roman Catholic and Orthodox critiques of the Protestant understanding of the Bible. They stand in line, in fact, with a long history of Roman Catholic analysis in particular, reflected most recently in significant books by Charles Taylor and Brad Gregory, that holds the Reformation at least partially responsible for the rise of modern secularism. For these reasons, in the words of one such theologian, we should, quote, regard the Reformation not as something to be celebrated, but as something to be lamented, end quote. Fourth way interpreters seek then to reconnect Protestant hermeneutics to a more distant past than they believe the Reformation represents. Uh, this includes ancient Christian exegesis. On their view, the correct way of approaching scripture certainly involves its literal reading, but we should not actually dismiss other levels of meaning in the text, especially when it comes to the Old Testament. Fourth way Protestants then tend to question the wholesale rejection of allegorizing among many modern heirs of the Reformation in pursuit of the retrieval of a medieval Platonist Christian synthesis. They advocate for the retrieval of a spiritual reading of scripture over against what they describe as modern Protestant biblicism that prioritizes literal and historical reading. So there are in fact multiple perspectives in contemporary Protestantism on how to read the Bible. Taught in our universities and seminaries, these multiple perspectives then filter down in various ways to ordinary Christian people on the ground, directly and indirectly. Even seminary students who make it their business directly to enter the debate can get confused as a result, not to say overwhelmed. Needless to say, other kinds of Christians are not likely to be less confused and overwhelmed to the extent that they encounter these very different opinions. 
And it appears indeed, as we survey the church scene, broadly speaking, in the post-Christian West at this time, that it does not take too much exposure to the confusion to sow serious doubts in many people's minds as to the viability of the whole Protestant enterprise altogether, to engender a loss of confidence in sola scriptura and in our ability to comprehend the meaning of this scriptura. I hope you recognize that, at least vaguely, as an accurate description of where we are. All of this raises an important question. Was the Reformation a mistake? Must we now abandon the Reformation's fundamental perspectives on the place of Scripture in our lives? Must we instead try to find our own way in the contemporary world as best we can, founding our lives on the opinions of the latest charismatic megachurch leader or dazzling public intellectual or political demagogue or in the sage advice of the television and radio personalities who possess the greatest reach, or on the basis of what most people think, or what is self-evidently right, or what I find myself most deeply to desire. These are grim internal alternatives indeed. But I do not believe for a moment that the Reformation was a mistake, and I hope that you don't either. In particular, and this brings me to the topic for this morning's lecture, is I do not believe for a moment that the magisterial reformers were mistaken about our need to stick in our Bible reading and in our preaching, to stick with the literal sense of the text, and to reject an allegorical or spiritual approach, especially with respect to the Old Testament, which has mainly been where the problem has arisen historically. I believe that reading the Old Testament literally is exactly what we should all continue to do, even if an increasing number of other Protestants appear to want to depart from this approach. I do not believe that we should depart from this approach. But perhaps we need to remind ourselves what this approach entails, given the widespread confusion presently about what the word literally actually literally means. And that's what I want to talk about in the remainder of this first lecture. And then in the second, I'll return to the question of allegorical reading and try to get clarity on what that is really about and why we should not engage in it. So this morning, I'm aiming at a fresh restatement of some very old Protestant ideas about biblical interpretation. I apologize in advance if you think this is unnecessary but in the way of many people on TV these days, I apologize, but I do not repent. <laughs> because actually I think that a restatement has become necessary in the broader context in which we now find ourselves. So, what does it mean to read scripture literally? What does it mean to read any text literally? Consider the following statement. I was literally glued to my seat throughout the entire performance. What the writer means is that he was metaphorically glued to his seat throughout the entire performance. He had no desire to leave it. And he evidently wishes to state this emphatically, which is how the word literally is functioning in that sentence. Had he been literally glued to his seat, he might well have found great difficulty leaving it even had he wished to do so. The addition of the word literally to this sentence is therefore unhelpful if the author's purpose is one of clear communication. He would have been better advised to leave the word literally out or to put in a less confusing alternative as a small contribution to the much to be desired general elimination of this emphatic use of the word literal from current English usage. Certainly the reformers were never tempted so far as we can tell to use the word, or more precisely, its Latin, German, or French equivalents in that manner. Of course, the omission of the word in the particular case I've just described would not necessarily prevent a communication problem arising. The readers of the text might still read the author as referring to the stickiness of his seat rather than his absorption in the performance. And such readers might well pride themselves precisely in their determination to read the text literally, to take it at face value. He says he was glued to his seat, they might say. We need to take him at his word. 
These are the kinds of readers that Peggy Parrish has in mind in her popular Learn to Read series of stories concerning Amelia Bedelia. These stories, as that great academic resource Wikipedia tells us, involve Amelia repeatedly misunderstanding various commands of her employer by always taking figures of speech and various terminology literally, causing her to perform incorrect actions with a comical effect. Much of her employment is as a maid for the wealthy couple known as the Rogers, who are astute enough to realize her literalism and write their requests as put the wet towels in the laundry and replace them with clean, dry ones, as opposed to simply change the towels. Because if you ask Amelia to change the towels, very likely she'll go out and buy new ones. After all, when she makes a sponge cake, she puts in real sponges, and when she pitches a tent, she throws it into the forest. In this case, the word literal refers to a kind of reading that misses the point of a communication through failing to understand how language is being used. The reader misunderstands what the author means to say, just as might happen in any other communicative situation in, we, in which people talk past each other. In truth, though, as Kevin Van Hooser suggests, that kind of reading does not deserve to be called literal reading at all, precisely because it does not attend carefully to the communicative intent of the person who put the letter of the text on the page in the first place. Van Hooser proposes, and I concur, that we call this kind of reading actually literalistic reading, just to make a clear distinction. For literalistic reading is, in truth, he says, a reading that is, quote, less than fully literal, insofar as it ignores the role of authorial intentions and communicative acts, end quote. Literalistic reading focuses only on the words in themselves, whereas a truly literal reading pays attention to the speech acts of the author and not just the words in themselves. Here is Van Hooser again. The literal meaning of Jesus' statement, I am the door, is a function of his speech act, a metaphorical assertion, not of the words taken individually and thus out of context. It is only at the level of the sentence act that we can speak of the actual literal sense." End quote. The literal sense of a text is discovered then not only by consulting a dictionary about what a word like door typically means in the language spoken by the author, that's important, but also paying attention as to how that word is actually being used in a particular speech act. An author might well use a word like door metaphorically, but nevertheless intend to communicate literal truth for example, about Jesus in the process. Literal reading makes room for that possibility. Literalistic reading does not. And if this is true, then in addition to avoiding the emphatic use of the word literal that I've just mentioned a moment ago, we should also avoid using it as the opposite of words like metaphorical, as in a sentence like this one. She failed to understand the metaphorical language in the poem and interpreted it literally. We should instead say, I think, in failing to understand the metaphorical language in the poem, she failed to interpret it literally, which is different. She missed the point of the literary communication, in other words. Now, that word less literalistic is, of course, a modern and not an ancient term. But the distinction I'm drawing here is one that the magisterial reformers certainly consider to be important. Luther is very interested in the ways that the biblical authors are artists and poets. He's very attentive to phenomena in the text, like Hebrew parallelism, metaphors, and metonymy. Calvin, too. William Bousma tells us, that like earlier commentators in the tradition of Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, Calvin regularly identified metaphor, allegory, personification, metonym, metonymy, synecdoche, and other tropes, other figures of speech. 
Calvin is indeed quite impatient with those who fail to grasp that a faithful reading of Scripture must attend to such phenomena. This impatience is well illustrated in the comments in his institutes about fanatical men, as he describes them, whose commitment to reading Scripture literally, as they see it, threatens to open the door to what Calvin calls a boundless barbarism that will overwhelm the whole light of faith. End quote. Those were the days. You could say stuff back then. Anyway. Uh, it was necessary, rather, in the reformer's view, for the biblical exegete to possess a sound knowledge of rhetoric, without which, Calvin observed, many supervacuous contentions will arise. Reformation exegetes could sometimes disagree about which texts were meant to be read metaphorically in accord with some figure of speech. Most famously, they disagreed about the interpretation of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist. But they did not disagree that the literal sense includes such phenomena. It so happens that in the hypothetical case of just a moment ago, our literalistic reader was guilty of failing to understand the metaphorical language specifically in a poem. But literalism is more than capable of fixing its bleary eye on other genres as well. So it is that a parable might easily be read by a literalistic reader as history, and so might an allegory, in neither case in line with the communicative intent of the author. The literal sense then is not to be equated with historical reference. Kevin Van Hooser again, who is paying me good money for representing him so well here this morning. Reference to historical empirical reality, he says, is only one of the things that language does. End quote. It's important to underline this point precisely because of the frequency with which we find the terms literal sense and historical sense in close proximity to each other and even virtually equated with each other in many discussions of biblical hermeneutics. This association is unproblematic if the intention is to underline that what authors mean, they always mean in historical contexts, involving the received meanings of words in particular languages, accepted literary conventions, and so on, which may, like definitions of words, change over time. The reformers' emphasis on the importance of reading biblical texts in their original languages and not in Latin translation already presupposes that kind of commitment to historical reading, as does their attentiveness to matters like the nature of grammar and syntax in the Hebrew and Greek texts that lay before them. Become a text critic, Luther advises his readers, and learn about the grammatical sense, whatever grammar intends, which is about faith, patience, death, and life. What God says in Scripture, he says in the ordinary language of those who lived in the past and were indeed conditioned by that past. People like Moses, who had a design, says Calvin in writing Genesis, and who used his own literary craft to further that design. In a way, the Reformation begins with this issue already front and center because the 95 Theses open with reference to the proper meaning of a biblical word. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. This word cannot be understood, writes Luther, as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy, end quote. So we begin by arguing about the meaning of a word. Just a few years later, Luther tells Erasmus in the bondage of the will that we must everywhere stick to the simple, pure, and natural sense of the words that accords with the rules of grammar and the normal use of language as God has created it in man. The same idea is often expressed in Calvin's writings In his search for the mind of God and the writings of St. Paul, for example, Calvin keeps firmly in mind, says Ward Holder, that Paul was a first century thinker who was conditioned by the cultures in which he moved and taught. 
Understood in this way, an insistence on the historical sense can be taken as an encouragement to the reader not to read anachronistically, as if an ancient author were writing in a much more recent idiom or more generally were operating as if a modern person. Historical interpretation refers, in the context of the Reformation, to respecting the sense that words would have had for their authors. That's Van Hooser again quoting Calvin's comment that the more the interpreter leads away from the author's meaning, so the more he leaves his own purpose and is certain to wander from his goal. Understood in this way, an insistence on the historical sense can also be taken as an encouragement to the reader to seek the mind of God in the mind of the human authors of Scripture and not somewhere else. As Ward Holder again says of Calvin's approach to Scripture, quote, when Calvin seeks to uncover the mind of the author in Scripture, he is attempting to have access to the divine mind, the Holy Spirit's intention. He does so, however, through the medium of the mind of the human author, to which we have direct and immediate access in a way that can never be the case with the divine mind, Ward Holder. So this is all uh, well and good so far in terms of what we may rightly and properly mean by historical sense. But in terms of what historically rooted texts understood in this way mean to say, we must still be careful. First, the possibility of historical reference in a text is only one of the things that a reader interested in its literal sense must consider. Texts may well be concerned with historical facts, as with all sorts of other facts, about the nature of the world, for example, but this may also not be the case. The literal cannot be reduced to the historical, the empirical, and the factual. To consider a non-biblical example, I may well need considerable amounts of historical background information in order fully to understand John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, A Pilgrim's Progress, including the, the knowledge of the state of English in his day. I would certainly need to know that. But the book itself was surely not intended to be read in this historical narrative. So I need historical background, but it itself is not an historical narrative. Likewise, the famous allegory of the cave in Plato's Republic when read literally, will be read allegorically and not historically in the sense of a historical narrative. In both cases, the communicative intent of the author is clear and a commitment to literal reading requires that we attend carefully to it. So this kind of allegorical reading is not at all to be contrasted with literal reading because actually it's in line with the literal sense of the text. This point is rather important, not just with respect to allegory, and it was well understood by Reformation writers. Commenting on his approach to the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, Calvin insists that we should have more reverence for Scripture than to allow ourselves to transfigure its sense so freely, we should instead attend to the mind of Christ. And of course, he's talking there about a number of patristic interpretations of the Good Samaritan, which in his opinion, depart from that principle. They're not really interested in what Jesus meant uh, in the parable. There's an even more important way, though, in which the literal cannot be reduced to the historical, the empirical, and the factual. A text may well mean to refer descriptively to the past. Such an event happened in such a way involving these actions and words. Yet, the purpose of the author in describing this past may not simply be to report about it, but also to draw significance from it, to teach something on the basis of it. That is to say, the heart of the communicative intent of the author lies not in the description of the past, but in prescription for the present. There's a message that he wishes to address to the reader in relation to what happened back then. Prior to the 18th century, and as an Old Testament scholar I always say, prior to the 18th century AD, just so we're sure what we're talking about, this was the primary reason why historiography was valued as an art that had close links to the ancient art of rhetoric, 
and had as its purpose to teach and indeed to delight the reader. The ancient words of Dionysius of Halicarnassus, written during the reign of the Roman Emperor Augustus, capture this reality well. History, he says, is philosophy teaching by examples. And so it is in scripture too. Certainly many of our biblical books mean to tell us about the past, but not for its own sake. They tell us their story about it in order to persuade us of certain truths and to advocate to us certain ways of living. And so we'll miss the point if we dwell on the facts or the events themselves. We shall, in fact, fail to read literally in terms of the full communicative intent of our biblical authors, precisely because our understanding of the literal has become identified too closely with a faulty view of the historical. That is, the historical as mere fact or mere event. The consequence of this kind of literal reading of the Bible, which is actually a literalistic reading of the Bible, is all too often that it is satisfied simply in establishing that the facts are indeed the facts before retiring to its intellectual or devotional bed for the night, none the wiser as to what the facts mean. First way historical critical reading has often been charged with inadequacy in precisely this respect and not without reason. The same is true, ironically though, of a considerable amount of third way historical grammatical reading that defines itself aggressively over against the first way. But the reading of the biblical text as literature in either case can be remarkably shallow. Another consequence is that a further move is then required by those who want to render the facts spiritually useful in some way as if the biblical authors had not already done so. Fourth way spiritual reading must make up for the assumed deficiencies of the text in its literal historical sense misunderstood. Just this problematic view is expressed, for example, by Michael Graves. Research into the ad literam sense alone, he claims, cannot uncover the contemporary significance of scripture. The results of literal biblical exegesis can only be past tense claims, such as, this is what Jeremiah said to the Judeans, or this is what Peter said to the first century church. I think that is completely untrue. It is just untrue to say that the results of literal exegesis can only be the ones that Grave describes here. Literal exegesis can and must involve much more than this, or it is simply not paying attention to the communicative intent of the biblical literature. Uh, it's not literal exegesis at all, if that's what it is. It is very unfortunate then to what a great extent historical critics, Chicago types, and contemporary spiritual readers, for all that they define themselves against each other, are joined in intellectual matrimony or polyamory by their common failure to grasp this simple point, by their common failure to think well about the literal. The consequence is that spiritual readers, rightly reacting to the deficiencies of much first and third way reading, all too often set out to solve a problem whose nature they have not fully analyzed. They want to help the text speak out of the past and into our contemporary concerns. But so focused are they on this quest that they fail to notice that the text is already doing this and does not need our help. It was only ever their readily opponents who needed help because of their inattention to all that the text was aiming to accomplish. The text itself was always doing just fine. So you see why it's so important to gain great clarity in this discussion of biblical hermeneutics, not only about what we mean by literal, but also about what we mean by historical. The kind of attentiveness to the communicative intent of an author that is thus required if a literal reading of a text is to be achieved is necessary, of course, not just with respect to sentences, but also to paragraphs, to sections of books, to whole books, and to whole collections of books, 
Words mean what they mean in sentences, but also in larger contexts. As Roland Barthes once put it, a narrative is but a large sentence. This is a reality to which modern biblical scholarship has sometimes been blind, insisting on an atomistic style of reading that frequently proceeds as if the parts of any particular biblical book have nothing to do with all the other parts of the same biblical book, and as if whole biblical books have nothing at all to do with the other books in the canonical collection, which when you say it that way appears to be a form of insanity, of course. In this first way of proceeding, the literal sense is conceived of predominantly in terms of the meaning of small units of text that emerge out of particular historical contexts, divorced from the larger literary context in which they now find themselves. Little attention is paid to the ordinary words of the biblical text as they reflect ordinary grammar and syntax or rhetorical device within whole biblical books the books that form part of the unfolding covenantal story of Scripture. This is, in truth, a bizarrely narrow and unhistorical idea of the literal, involving what Stephen Chapman describes as, quote, isolating and freezing in time texts that historically were read and transmitted together, end quote. It's an idea, of course, with which the reformers would certainly have had no sympathy. The literal reading of text requires attention to larger as well as smaller literary contexts. For example, what is the literal sense of Psalm 2? In itself, as an individual composition, we might well imagine that at one time it functioned in ancient Israel as a royal coronation psalm, celebrating the moment when God installed his king on Zion, my holy hill, adopting him as a son and giving him the world as his inheritance. This is a perfectly reasonable hypothesis about what the psalm in itself once meant in pre-exilic Israel. It formed part of the Israelite liturgy of that period. Yet we must recognize that the psalm as we encounter it now is not in itself. Although it's marked off as an independent entity, that is, it's Psalm 2 and not Psalm 3, at the same time, it is not an isolated entity. It has a literary context within the Book of Psalms, and in its present form, the Book of Psalms dates from the post-exilic period. We know that just from Psalm 137, quite apart from anything else, which looks back, of course, on the exile. This is long after the period of the historical monarchy of Israel. So what is this royal psalm doing as one of two introductory psalms in the book of Psalms? In an era when there are no Israelite or Judean kings, why retain in this literature any psalms that speak of the king? It can only be because such psalms are now intended as anticipatory of a kingdom that is yet to come. They are intended to speak about a son of David who has not yet arrived. That, I suggest, is their literal reading, literal meaning within the context of the book of Psalms. That is how they are intended to be read, not only as liturgy, but now also as prophecy. This is indeed how these Psalms evidently were being read already in the pre-Christian centuries that followed the composition of the book. And you can track this in the Septuagint, and you can track it also at Qumran. In this example, we discover then that there are in fact two ways of reading the text literally, depending on which authors we are considering as possessing communicative intent. Is it the author of Psalm 2 as an individual composition, or is it the author of the whole book of Psalms? There is here what could happily be described using the terminology of the 14th century Christian author Nicholas of Lyra, as a double literal sense. The reformers, of course, were not modern biblical scholars and they did not write in modern idiom. Neither they nor Nicholas of Lyra would have described the complexity of the literal sense of the book of Psalms in precisely the way that I've just briefly attempted. But the magisterial reformers certainly were interested in reading Psalms first as individual compositions rooted in historical context. Even in his early lectures on the book of Psalms in 1513 through 1516, 
when Luther was still much more of a medieval than the reformed exegete, even then we find Luther asking questions about the nature and scope of whichever individual psalm lies before him and displaying, especially in his treatment of the later psalms, an emerging sensitivity to questions about the original historical context. This is more evidently the case in Calvin's work on the Psalms published in 1557, in which he commonly interprets them in this original context and only then reads them in wider contexts. The same interest in historical context can be found in both writers' approach to other biblical books. But then secondly, on the other hand, both reformers would have regarded as incomplete any efforts of theirs to read literally any section of a biblical book had they not then proceeded to read it in the larger context. So for example, Ward Holder again says this, Calvin always believed that each book of the scripture represented a coherent effort at expression by its author. And we routinely find in Calvin's commentaries therefore attention to the nature of the whole as well as of the parts of a particular book, not least in the argumentum that appears at the beginning of each of his commentaries on Paul's letters and seeks, among other things, to provide an overall sense of that letter's meaning. Both reformers would have regarded anything less than such efforts to read contextually as a failure to make the attempt to read fully literally. And surely they would have been right to believe this. The literal sense should not be conceived of predominantly in terms of the meaning of small units of text that emerge out of particular historical context divorced from larger literary contexts in which they are now embedded. And this brings me finally and briefly to the question of typology. In the example I cited from the Psalms just a moment ago, the Davidic king no longer stands for himself alone but also points beyond himself to someone in David's line who still lies in the future of the book's final compilers. This kind of now and not yet perspective in biblical texts has often been referred to under the heading of typology, especially as it appears in narrative texts. The term figuration is often regarded as a synonym for typology Earlier chapters of the biblical story prefigure the later ones in this way. Resemblance within the context of the whole biblical story is the key idea. Within this context, into which Christian believers are also now to read themselves, within this context, certain persons or entities are or ought to be like each other in various ways. But more than that, since the biblical story moves ever onwards, typology also reckons with the reality that at least some of the resemblances involve a lesser and a greater. It is this fact that justifies Errol Ellis's description of a typological or figurative reading as one that, quote, relates the past to the present in terms of a historical correspondence and escalation in which the divinely ordered prefigurement finds a complement in the subsequent and greater event. At the same time, though, it would be a mistake to assume that escalation is always or even normally in view when typological connections are present. For this reason, Dan Trier's more neutral definition of typological reading is, I think, preferable. He proposes that we think of it simply as iconic mimesis, which preserves a narrative coherence between reference. The main point here is to resist the idea that there is in the New Testament any generalized notion that God's dealings with Israel in the Old Testament are any less real or any less important in themselves than his dealings with the church in the New Testament. It was precisely because of the tendencies of some typological reading in this direction that Luther could be found criticizing the typological approach, even though he himself was far from shy about making typological connections between texts. 
But the crucial thing for Luther was that it must absolutely be understood that these connections were between real people of faith and their institutions in the Old Testament and real people of faith and their institutions in the New. God did not reveal himself in the Old Testament through figurative hints, nor did that body of literature merely provide images for the later Christ event. For Luther, and he goes on about this at some length in different places, for Luther, the Israelites lived their own substantive life of faith in response to God's revelation in Old Testament events, and then they also prefigured New Testament realities. Likewise, however much the Old Testament is considered in the New to point beyond itself, this is not at the cost of the reality or importance of God's dealings with his Old Testament people. As Hans Frey puts it, and I think he's quite right, in typology, without loss to its own literal meaning or specific temporal reference, an earlier story or occurrence becomes a figure of a later one. This being so, it's clear that we should not drive a wedge between the literal and the typological, as atomistic readers tend to do, reserving the vocabulary of the literal only for those small units that I mentioned a moment ago. The literal and the typological of the figurative are best understood not as two different ways of reading, but as two aspects of the same way of reading. The latter, the typological and figurative, comes into its own, not so much at the level of the sentence or paragraph, but at the level of larger entities like whole books or collections of books. In Hans Frey's words once again, typological reading involves, quote, literalism at the level of the whole biblical story. Figuration should not be conceived of, says Fry, as being in conflict with the literal sense of biblical stories, but as being at once a literary and an historical procedure, an interpretation of stories and their meanings by weaving them together into a common narrative referring to a single history and its patterns of meaning. Literal and typological, then, should not, I suggest, be considered as opposites, nor were they generally considered to be so by the magisterial reformers. Calvin's general commitment to this kind of large-scale contextual reading is well illustrated by his approach to Paul's letters in his commentaries on these texts, for example. He's not only interested in reading well all of Romans as an entire book in itself, but also in reading Romans within the context of the whole corpus of the Pauline literature and then the whole of Scripture. In general, his belief in Catherine Green McCrate's words is that, quote, the story of Israel repeats itself in the life of the Christian reader, and thus the words of the text are addressed not only to the characters in the story, but also to Calvin and to all readers, end quote. With respect to typological reading specifically, for example, what happens to Abraham's family in Genesis 21 after the birth of Isaac foreshadows typologically, that is, it is analogous to the birth of the Christian church in the New Testament. That is Calvin's understanding of how the Apostle Paul reads the passage in Galatians 4, implying what Calvin in his commentary on Galatians refers to as mystical interpretation which is not inconsistent with the true and literal meaning since the house of Abraham was then at that time a true church. And that reference happily brings us to the end of the first lecture. For as many of you will know, it is in Galatians 4 that we find the sole New Testament occurrence of the Greek verb allegoreo, which many people translate in, into English as allegory, and it is to this Galatians passage that the advocates of allegorical reading first resort when seeking to justify the practice in terms of apostolic warrant. Whether they are right to do so is one of the central questions to which we shall return in the second lecture. For the moment, let me just summarize then the main thrust of my argument to this point. We should, I propose, insist still in line with the magisterial reformers that scripture is to be read literally. But we need to be clear about what they meant by this and what we should mean by it. 
Literal reading is not literalistic reading, and that is not what we should advocate for. What does it mean to read literally? It means to read scripture in accordance with its various apparent communicative intentions as a collection of texts from the past, whether in respect to smaller or larger sections of text. It means to do so taking full account of the nature of the language in which these intentions are embedded and revealed as components of scripture's unfolding covenantal story. Literal reading is, in other words, to to seek to understand scripture what scripture is saying to us in just the ways we try to understand what other people are saying to us, taking into account as we do their age, their culture, their customs, and their language, and indeed the verbal context within which the words and sentences are located. That, I suggest, is what it means to read literally in pursuit of the communicative intent of God through scripture, in search of what to believe, how to live, and what to hope for. Literal reading is always at the same time to read canonically by reading figuratively, which is not the same thing at all, I shall argue, as reading allegorically. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, and uh, then we will take a 30-minute coffee break and come back for the second lecture. Uh, If you have a question, I have a second mic here, Uh, raise a hand and please introduce yourself. Uh, Just state your name and your relationship to um, North Park and um, then ask your question, please. Jay Phelan, I teach uh, New Testament here. Peter Enns talks about the difference between a Christocentric reading of the New Old Testament and a Christotelic. Um, and by that, I take him to mean that, say, Isaiah in chapter 7 and chapter 53 was not necessary, was not talking about Jesus. Uh, and a Christocentric reading would take him to be talking about Jesus, but a Christotelic reason would take Isaiah to be talking about you know, his own situation and, and which ultimately then is read in a um, telic sense uh, to be um, connected with in the typological way that you're discussing uh, with Jesus. Is that a fair way to, to, would you see that as a fair way of summing up the question or you want to uh, yeah, uh, uh, rethink that a little bit? Yeah, I would want to nuance that a bit, I think, because I think the missing piece there is the transition from the 8th century context of Isaiah through the canonical process to the New Testament reading. So to me, that that seems rather binary in the way Peter has set that up. I would actually say that although Isaiah himself certainly had the immediate circumstances in mind, and you can see that very, very clearly from the context of that passage, that in the context of the book of Isaiah, though, that passage is already caught up in a much broader thing in which the significance of Isaiah's words for the future and so on, all of that's already being explored. So I would see that as very much analogous to what I said about the Psalms. I think the significance of uh, Hezekiah, as I take that to be about the significance of Hezekiah already in the book of Isaiah as part of the structuring device of the whole book where Ahaz is the untrusting king, Hezekiah is the, is the trusting one, and the way in which the Hezekiah passage leads into the comfort, comfort my people and all of that. Um, so I, I would say that already in the way the tradition is being shaped canonically, uh, together with the law and the prophets more generally, that already the broader contexts are leading in that direction. So I don't think that the New Testament writers, when they're reading Psalm 2, for example, are simply, as it were, um, doing something new in the light of the resurrection or anything like that. I think they're developing lines of interpretation already found in the Old Testament literature. And indeed, lines of interpretation already evident in pre-Christian Judaism as well. 
Another question? Uh, Stephen Chester, Professor of New Testament. Just, just really building on the last question, um, it, it seems to me then that what, you, you know, what you're saying about the historical process is that often when New Testament writers perceive an Old Testament text to refer to Christ, um, because of the process of interpretation that's gone on, um, what's provocative and different in their own context about the way they're reading those texts is not that they read those texts as messianic, but that they identify the Messiah as Jesus. That's exactly what I believe, yeah. and I'd be interested to have your reaction to that, but that's exactly what I believe. I think there's, a, there's been a very unfortunate tendency to overstress the newness of things in the New Testament, as it were. And of course, as an Old Testament scholar, I'm bound to object to that, so it's, there's a matter of professional pride, I suppose, bound up with this, but I just don't think that's right. And later on in the second lecture, I'll talk a little bit about the Emmaus Road story and the significance of that story, actually, in, in this context. So, Absolutely, the scandal and, and the astonishingness of that lies not so much, I think, in, in the novelty of interpretation. In fact, what strikes me about the Gospels is that people often react with amazement and astonishment, but they don't typically say, you can't say that. <laughs> that's nonsense. That, that's incomprehensible to us. You know, it, you get a very clear impression that Jesus is talking into a context where people may well violently disagree with them about the interpretation. But it's not as if he's talking Martian, if, if, I, if I can put it that way. So yes, exactly so. I think it's identifying this particular person from Nazareth who dies this scandalous death on the cross with all of those uh, um, Old Testament themes and, and so on. That's what's, the, that's what's the astonishing scandalous thing, really. Yes. My name is Eric Landon. I'm a third year MDiv student. Um, and perhaps you're going to get to this in your second lecture, uh, but what's coming to mind is uh, as we look at pre modern interpretations of scripture and exegesis and the allegoric, allegorical interpretations that are used, how do we as, um, as Christians today, as people in ministry, um, trying, seeking to help people understand the text, but also to appreciate the tradition that we've come from. How, how should we take uh, those sorts of allegorical interpretations? Is there anything there for us to be gleaned from, or is that something that we just need to reject altogether? Well, I'll come back to this, um, of course, in, at greater length. I think the best case scenario with allegorical reading is that something useful is being said using the wrong text. And, and that's not like dangerous, it's just unfortunate. But the worst case scenario is something very wrong is being said by that. And I think there's a lot more of that in our tradition than many of us would like to think, actually. So I would say that the post-apostolic folks uh, would expect us to measure them against the apostles. In fact, do expect us to measure them against the apostles. I take them at their word, and I appreciate them as Christian brothers and sisters, and I recognize the quality of their faith and the level of their sacrifice, far exceeding mine and all of that, but I cannot avoid making critical judgments about whether this or that thing that they're doing is something that I want to be doing or think is wholesome or wise or, or whatever. And so I think we, I think we ought to react to the, the fathers and the other folks in the Middle Ages and so on, all the way down to the present, as uh, they're people in our church, you know, and, and, and they may well speak wisdom to us, and they may sometimes speak folly, and they may sometimes introduce heresy, actually, in, into the church, unfortunately. So we cannot avoid being discriminating, I think. The Reformers themselves were in no sense against tradition. In fact, one of the things they most commonly said in the 16th century was it was the other lot who had left the tradition. They were not the ones leaving the tradition. 
Um, they were against traditions, small t, plural, in the sense that of things that they found in the church that they could see no warrant for. But they refer back to the creeds and they re they're, they're reasonably relaxed about the council, certainly given the alternative anyway. And um, they're, they're pretty robustly affirming of the tradition with the capital T, but not uncritically so. And I think that's exactly how we should be. Hi, Jeremy, a student in the MDiv program. Um, could you comment a bit, um, you know, if we, even if we limit ourselves to the scholars that uh, have a commitment to that literal uh, approach that, that you've advocated, you know, we find a breadth of, when they do then their scholarship on a passage, a breadth of understandings and interpretations and meanings. So I guess partly maybe because of, you know, I'm a product of the postmodern culture. I'm a little bit skeptical that kind of this, this uh, uh, focusing on this literal um, approach uh, actually helps us come to a more objective, appropriate, right understanding. So could you comment a bit on that? Sure. I think I've understood you pretty well in what you just said there. I think I've got your communicative intention. Not sure how difficult it was. Um, of course, we're speaking English, and that's my first language, and it's probably yours as well, I'm guessing. But uh, even with people speaking foreign language, I can make strides to learn that language and so on and talk to these people. So I think this pluralism thing is A, overplayed, and B, not particularly relevant, actually. Because if it were true that we could not arrive at su sufficient objectivity, in our reading of scripture, for scripture to function as an authority, then where exactly would we be in terms of orthodox apostolic Christian faith? So I'm obliged by my discipleship, I believe, to believe in the perspicuity of scripture and to consider the pluralism you're describing as an unfortunate consequence of the fact that we're all fallen and not particularly we don't all have 20-20 vision, and I may be wrong and you may be wrong, but the thing I'm not prepared to concede is that we both, both may be right. We need to argue with each other in a friendly or not so friendly manner, depending on the seriousness of the issue. Um, and we need to not give in to this pluralism. Descriptively, I recognize there is pluralism. As soon as we begin to make that pluralism prescriptive, I think we all ought to give up and go fishing instead. An MDiv is a very expensive way to spend your life. Fishing license in BC costs 40 bucks. <coughs> uh, so I don't think the perspicuity of scripture in the reformer's mind or in mine, I don't hold to that because everything is clear to me in scripture. I hold to it because scripture it claims to give us that clarity as a lamp to our feet and all the rest of it. And it's commended to us as doing so. Um, so, Yep, there is pluralism. But then the New Testament recognizes pluralism too. It talks about people twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. That's pluralism. So I have a very robust view on that right? because I think the other way is the way to oblivion, actually. So I think we always ascribe objectivity to the things we want to have authority in our lives, actually, to be perfectly honest. If it's not scripture, it's something else. So. Uh, my name is Jacob Kim. I am a graduate of uh, North Park, and I'm doing ministry. And uh, I've been also researching into ancient, many Korean script, and uh, I'm struck by the West tendency on focus on logical thing, reason alone. That's why because of the relational aspect is very sacrificed. Whether is this literal or metaphorical, this kind of this, this question is within the tradition of a reason-oriented thing. 
The reason why allegorical interpretation arises is that they are searching for relational aspect too. Mm -hmm. So to me, we should look at the whole things from the perspective of integration. Uh, I was very surprised by the fact that Luther and Zwingli mainly argued about whether is this literal or whether this is uh, symbolic, more like that. But actually what Jesus says, remember me, Jesus' point was a relational thing, the meaning of a new covenant. Mm -hmm. Jesus was saying that, I believe, he was explaining the meaning of his death on the cross and the resurrection through his death on the cross, he would establish the new covenant, new relationship between God and his people. But that point was always put aside and people mainly argued about interpretation. So mm -hmm. I okay. think that's the real, because we suffered from this uh, Greek tradition of this reason. Mm -hmm. That's why. So this relational aspect has been put aside. So we should look at the whole thing from a very Good. different Good, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not very fond of the Greeks. I think they've done quite a bit of damage. So I'm particularly not very keen on Greek-style rationalism. And of course, the Christian life is about more than reasoning. But I would say it's not about less than reasoning either. There seems to me to be a lot of appeals made to the intellect and to thinking and to reasoning and to making sure you have the truth right and, and you can speak about it and articulate it. And all of that's New Testament stuff, not just Old Testament. And of course, it's all within an integrated view, or it should be. That's aspirationally what we're looking for is to find the right way of holding reason and relationality and all the rest of it together. And certainly I don't think Christian faith can be or should be reduced to reason. On the other hand, reason has an important place um, in the context of our conversation. I don't think our relationship would last too long or be very healthy if we weren't paying attention to each other's communications. So, you know, I'm thinking about my marriage here and I hate to think what would happen if I took that line, right? I mean, I think paying attention to, to understand what the other person is saying is a very, very important part of, of relationship, actually. And it seems to be very much a part of uh, the way in which God deals with us because he's given us his word. And uh, understanding it requires that we put the same effort into that as we do understanding other people. So I don't disagree with what you're saying about not reducing things, etc. All of that's very true. But if we don't use our God-given reason where we should, I think other trouble arises. So when we're trying to think through what we even mean by the word literal, and for that matter, talking about relationality, what we even mean by the word love, that requires some analytical ability. The word love in our culture is a plastic word, isn't it? It means whatever people want it to mean. Well, we don't want to believe that, I think. We believe, I hope, that the word love has content that can be established by careful study. Um, that's important, right? And using our reason rightly in pursuit of these goals is an important part of what it means to be a disciple. Now, understanding what love means doesn't mean I will actually love. On the other hand, not understanding what it means, I find it then difficult to know how I would know what to do next and how I would know what love was if I saw it. So these are not things we can afford to pull apart. They have to be held together, it seems to me. Let's say thank you and we'll take a break.